So hi, my name is uh, Céline Carré and I am an editor for the journal Embromolecular Medicine. So I am here today with Dr. Eric Green, who is the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute and a keynote speaker at the conference of EMBO EMBL Science and Society. Dr. Green, thank you for taking time to talk to us. So 10 years ago, when you completed, uh, you and partners, completed the Human Genome Project, uh, did you anticipate progress to be slow or to be fast? Well, I think genomicists in general are incredibly optimistic types. We're, we're rather audacious in our goals. Any of us who were involved in the Genome Project set out to do something we couldn't really imagine how we were going to do it when it started, but we knew we had to get it done, and we did. Um, and so literally the day the Genome Project ended, um, our institute, the National Human Genome Research Institute, published a strategic vision for the field of genomics. And, you know, looking back on that, I think many of us who authored or co-authored that strategic plan, you know, knew there'd be progress, but, and we were fairly optimistic, but I don't think any of us anticipated things to happen as quickly as they did, especially in the arena of technology development. So what surprised you the most is the technology advancement. Uh, I think the thing that surprised me the most in terms of getting us to where we are today absolutely would be technological advances, and particularly in the area of DNA sequencing. In terms of surprises, I mean, there are lots of other surprises that have taken place in the 10 years since the end of the Genome Project. Uh, and you ask different people, you'll, you'll find out slightly different answers. I would say the thing that I, I would probably say was the most surprising is as we started to learn what the three billion letters of the human genome sequence actually meant, and we went to interpret and therefore then annotate the functionally important parts of the genome, was the realization that the the, among the set of functional sequences that we now know about, only a minority of those sequences directly code for protein, for protein coding genes. And in fact, probably the incredible complexity that humans have in their biological systems are not in our gene number, 20,000 genes, only a small number more than worms and flies. That's not our complexity. Our complexity probably resides in these non-coding functional sequences which by sheer base pair counting, you know, count for a larger amount of the genome than our protein coding genes and gene sequences. So in your future visions published in 2003 and 2011, you had a strong emphasis on communication and training for everyone. How did you think that improved in the past years and has it improved? And I like the way you asked the question because you said everyone because I really, I really think, having been involved in genomics for 25 years, we're seeing a substantial change, and I think it'll continue to be the case between now and the end of the decade. Ten years ago, maybe it started that when the Genome Project ended and we started to say, wow, we've got to apply knowledge of the genome to human disease and human health. And so I think the health professionals started to get interested in this, knowing that clinical research was going to be a key part of this puzzle. But now, you know, in 2013 and looking forward to the end of this decade, there are real examples where genomics is going to be relevant. Could you give us maybe a couple of concrete examples? So, uh, very concrete examples that are here and now in some ways um, would be, for example, pharmacogenomics, big long word, but basically using genomic information and variants people have in their DNA that affect drug metabolism, for example, to tailor which medications to give them. So selecting the right medication for the right person based on their unique genetic makeup, genomic makeup. That would be one example. Here and now, for a number of drugs, that list will grow in the coming years. Another example that's here and now for some types of cancer is cancer genomics, where we can use genomic information about a patient's tumor to basically better uh, determine exactly which subtype of cancer they may have and maybe the best way to treat that individual with that cancer. So increasingly, and, th and that list will grow substantially, increasingly genomics will be relevant to patients and friends and relatives of patients, which means every one of us. Yes. So I think a lot about this, that sure, we need scientists to understand genomics and increasingly we need health professionals, whether it be physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and so forth. We need the general public understanding this. And so, you know, we think about what we can be doing and, and we want to do everything we can to foster public engagement in genomics mm -hmm. to improve general genomic literacy across all of society. So do you think there is a real um, 
interest from the clinicians and the health practitioners to use genomic medicine for their patient or patient Increasingly, care? but you know what? Ge the patients are bringing genomics to, really? the, to the health professionals. I mean, this is a, you know, the current crowd. I mean, wh wh what happens if somebody all of a sudden finds themselves or a family member or a friend with a type of cancer? They mm -hmm. go to the internet. They do a lot of research themselves. They find out that, oh my Lord, you know, genomics is relevant for cancer. They're gonna go in asking questions. Increasingly, the particularly health curious individuals indeed are starting to go on the internet and learn about genomics, in some cases, getting genomic testing done on themselves with these direct to consumer genetic companies that have, have mm -hmm. set up. And you know, some people like them, some people don't like them. I think there's pluses and minuses to deal with, but there's a pretty um, you know, aggressive consumerism associated with some of this from the consumer seeking information because it's relevant to their health. And so I think even if the healthcare professionals aren't all interested, I, the mm. patients are bringing it to them and the scientists are bringing it to them. But I think by and large, it, it probably varies from discipline to discipline, but I certainly think practicing cancer physicians, oncologists, they recognize this is a key part of their future. Mm. Pediatricians have for a long time always embraced medical genetics as something very important because of a lot of pediatric, especially rare diseases and newborn screening and so forth. Yes. They realize these advances are now becoming very relevant. So the, 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 the challenge is how do you deal with a field that's moved very fast mm -hmm. um, and now deal with not only training the next generation of these health professionals to make sure they're competent genomics, but deal with a lot of people like my medical classmates or individuals who are midway through their career where all of a sudden the advances have been so fast and furious, they've never gotten any formal training thinking about how do you sort of bring them up to speed on genomics because it will influence their clinical practice in the coming years. So you just mentioned briefly about this um, preclinical, sorry, prenatal and uh, newborn screens yep. that are done routinely. So I read um, somewhere that uh, some of those companies that you mentioned as well, they actually propose screens to future prospective parents to just look at what the genome of their hypothetical baby could look like. Well, it's not, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do under some circumstances, um, uh, and it's a matter of what are the circumstances appropriate. As we get more and more knowledge of rare genetic diseases, um, and especially recessive rare genetic diseases, it's going to be straightforward to catalog parents with respect to which of those variants they may have and whether they would put a child at risk for a rare genetic disease, and there's things that one might consider that, and for devastating diseases that make, may make a lot of sense. And we do this already. I can tell you uh, prior to myself, in the case of my wife and I, when we went to have children, since I am an, an, I'm a descendant of Ashkenazi Jews, I'm at risk for Tay-Sachs disease, and so it's a very simple, they did a test on me to see if I was a carrier. My wife is not of Ashkenazi Jewish descent, so um, she, they, don't, they don't screen her until they see if I'm positive, but I screen negative. So, that, so we were doing this, and that was you know, 18 years ago. Mm -hmm. I think that's perfectly fine. I think the ethical issues we start running into in the kind of circumstance that you describe is yes. when you could do whole genome analysis and you can yes. catalog many more things, yes. what yes. do we do when we move beyond the particularly bad exactly. lethal disorders that everybody would agree exactly. would, parents should have a right to sort of try to intervene? And that's where it, it gets more dicey. But I would also point out that we, and we have to keep our, we have to manage expectations here. Um, when you get beyond the rare single gene disorders, if you're going to like shuffle two halves of a deck together as you do when you have a child, you know, we don't really understand what, how, yet how most of these variants are going to influence traits and phenotypes. We understand the, the overt ones, the, the mutations that are associated with rare diseases, but many of these other things, these other attributes, it's going to be very hard to understand for a long time. But I, I, I think we need to be cognizant of the ethical, legal, and social implications of these mm -hmm. capabilities. Mm -hmm. And it's worth mentioning, of course, that these new methods for sequencing DNA are so exquisitely sensitive mm -hmm. that now we're to the point that if we want to prenatally um, uh, and find out about an unborn child's genomic makeup, we don't even have to do invasive procedures like amniocentesis or chorionic villa sampling and mm -hmm. demonstrated in papers that have just come out this past year. Um, indeed, the, although this has been a body of work that's been going on for a better part of five to ten years, knowing that there is free-floating fetal DNA in maternal blood, which you can access by simple blood draw, but we knew it was there, but the idea that we can use these exquisitely sensitive DNA sequencing methods to not only analyze that DNA, you can get complete sequences of that unborn child.
Uh, and some people have a vision to sequence a baby's genome at birth, put it in their electronic health record, and part of standard of care will be that pediatrician at each visit every year, annual physical. They also re-annotate, re-analyze that sequence for new information, and that just sort of follows you for life. But lots of questions come out. There's a lot of logistical questions, huge ethical questions, and just some very practical questions of, are we ready to do that? Thank you very much, Dr. Green, for your time. Great. It was lovely talking to you. Very nice to talk to you. Thank you.